Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Steph and today we are doing the mid-year book tag. As I did last year, I'm going to be switching up the questions. Some of the questions are definitely gonna remain the same from the original tag, which I will link the creators and the original tag questions down below. But some of these will be questions from last year that I got from my patrons and a few new questions that patrons submitted this year. So I think that these questions just encompass my year a little bit more. I like to use the mid-year tag kind of like another quarterly check-in for the year, except this time around, I'm not gonna be going over stats as much as I did in my quarterly check-in but we are going to be talking about a ton of different books and some of my goals for the rest of the year and what we are going to be doing moving forward for the rest of 2024. So jumping right in with question number one, the best book that I have read this year. So I think my best book of this year has to be Natural Beauty by Ling Ling Wong. I... I think about this book a lot. I think about it a lot. I read this in January, so it was one of the very first books that I read this year, and it was a wild ride. Like, I've definitely suppressed some of the things in this book, and I know that because Erin read it, and she was like, what the fuck did you just have me read? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> And it has to be one of my favorite books because A, I think about it a lot. Like I think about it a lot unprompted. And B, the amount of visceral reactions that I had throughout the entirety of this book, but very much so towards the end of this book. Here's the thing, anytime a book gives me an extremely visceral reaction, I either go one of two ways. Did I love this or did I hate it? And Natural Beauty was one of those things where I immediately ended it, had the most visceral reaction to the ending, and I was like, I think I hate this, but I also think that this is gonna be one of the best books that I read this year. And the more that I've sat with it and the further away that I've gotten from it, I just constantly think about it. It's kind of like my Catherine House, where Catherine House was one of those books that I immediately ended the book, thought that it was just kind of mid for me because I had so many visceral reactions to everything that was happening in it. And to this day, it's something that I think about constantly constantly. Catherine House, I read in 2020 and it still lives in my head. This is giving me that same vibe and I feel like this is going to constantly live in my head. So it has to be my best book of the year because I just have so many conflicting emotions about everything that happened in this book. To give you the briefest synopsis of this, we are basically following a main character who starts working at this place called Holistic and Holistic is kind of what it implies. It's a brand that holistically from the inside out tries to help women achieve beauty. And in theory, they believe that this starts from within, but there's obviously topical creams and things like any other beauty industry. It's giving goop. And our main character is in this really weird situation because both of her parents are in comas and she is just trying to get by with taking care of them, but also taking care of herself. And she ends up at Holistic just because she needs a job. But quickly, our main character, who was at first very ambivalent about the beauty industry, starts to become obsessed with the beauty industry, but more so so starts to become obsessed with Helen, who is the owner of Holistic. Things begin to take a very weird and scary turn, and this is where the body horror starts to come in, and our main character starts to see the horrors within Holistic and the beauty industry and what people do to remain beautiful. And I think that if you participate in the beauty industry in any capacity, then this will really fuck you up mentally and I loved it. As for the honorable mention, I won't say too much about it, but the honorable mention is The Ruin of Kings by Jen Lyons. This has been one of the few fantasy books that has stuck with me this year. I feel like I've been struggling to find new favorite fantasies, and this definitely is going to be one of my new favorite fantasy series. I really enjoyed Jen's writing. It's so unserious and it's so over the top, and the humor and that over the top writing actually worked very well for me, but I can understand why other people wouldn't enjoy that writing style. It's definitely Definitely not one of those fantasy books that I think will be universally loved simply because of how chaotic it is, and that's probably the best way to describe this series in general is just chaotic. At the heart of this book, you are following a main character named Kieran, and Kieran is kind of wanted for many different reasons in this world. And we get to hear his perspective in the story, but we also get to hear from a perspective named Talon, who is also telling Kieran's story, but in a very different timeline. And so we are getting two timelines of Kieran's life that lead up to this really intense ending of this book and set up to the entirety of the series and world that continues to be expanded through each book. And I only wanna leave you with that intrigue because I think knowing little about this book going in makes it a lot more fun. There are so many twists and turns throughout the entirety of this book. And I mean, so many twists and turns. So many 
twists and turns. The next question is the best sequel that you've read this year. I mean, without any hesitation, it's Assassin's Fate. And this could very much be my favorite book of the year, but I wanted to add this as my favorite sequel because I actually haven't read many sequels this year, let alone sequels that I thought were worthy of being the best sequel that I've read. But this hands down has to be one of my best books of all time. And it will be the best sequel that I've read this year. I don't think anything will ever come close to this book. Basically, this is the last book in the entirety of the Realm of the Elderlings, but more specifically, it's the last book in the Fits and the Fool trilogy, which is the last trilogy in the Realm of the Elderlings, which is like a 16 book series. The series as a whole is for the most part following Fitz and the Fool, but it also has like two interspersing series that follow another family called the Vestrit family. And while everything seems separate when you are first starting your journey in the Realm of the Elderlings, everything actually comes together and this book is that culmination. And I don't think I'm going to be able to talk about it with you because I will cry. <laughs> I will be extremely emotional that this is over. I have been reading The Realm of the Elderlings for the last year and I ended up putting off this trilogy for a very long time because I wasn't ready to say goodbye to this world or any of these characters and I still like am not ready to think about the fact that I'm done with the world like I'm definitely going to be rereading this time and time again like even though this is a devastating series it's obviously going to be a comfort series but I'm just not really ready to go back yet because of how this emotionally damaged me but I can say hands down that this will be one of the best books that I will ever read in my life and that is simply because Robin Hobb's mind is unmatched and I don't say that lightly and I don't say that because I absolutely love Robin Hobb and like to me Robin Hobb is probably my favorite author of all time I I say that because one of the things that I've always said about Robin Hobb, despite loving her dearly and loving these characters and loving this world, I do think that she's not great at endings. In most every series that we've gotten in the Realm of the Elderlings, I've never been extremely satisfied with any of the endings. Part of me wondered if that was because the Realm of the Elderlings is interconnected, but the other part of me was like, maybe she's just bad at endings because why, why do they all end like that? And I confidently want to say now that it's because it's all interconnected. And I know that's annoying for some readers, but like her mind is truly truly a brilliant place because the way that all of the things that I've ever questioned, complained about, were frustrated with, everything was answered. Everything was resolved and we got the ending that like, I don't know if we deserved this ending, but like it was an ending that was literally perfect for everything that happened in this whole entire series and in this world and with these characters. So I have to say that it's pretty much a perfect ending and it's again hands down one of the best books that I will read ever in my life. If you don't know anything about the Realm of the Elderlings I can talk about Assassin's Apprentice because that is what starts it all and in Assassin's Apprentice you are following our main character Fitz and Fitz when you meet him is about six years old and then throughout the Realm of the Elderlings we get to see him grow into like a 60 year old man by the time we get to Fitz and the Fool and he is the bastard son of one of the kings in waiting and he ends up becoming a assassin for the king because they would rather use him for their own gain than him potentially grow up and try to usurp the throne. And from that very moment that he becomes the assassin for the king, which is actually his grandfather, his life is just a series of tragedies and it is very devastating. I can't emphasize enough how Fitz goes through a mentally devastating time throughout the entirety of the series. Like, I mean, every type of emotion that you can imagine Fitz is experiencing it as well as just like the people around him they tr they are trying their best but they they're not doing well they're not doing well for this little boy and he grows into a very broken man and that is just a very big theme throughout the entirety of the realm of the underlings with like most of the characters so very devastating but one of the best books that I will probably ever read in my life. Question number three is the best audiobook that I've listened to this year. This one hands down has to go to Act Your Age, Eve Brown. I really love the audiobooks for all three of the Brown Sisters books, but this one in particular was such a good listening experience. On top of the fact that this will also be one of my top books of the year, Eve and Jacob as individual characters really resonated with me, but then the way that they interacted with each other, but also 
the way that Eve stands up for Jacob was just like, it really, really got me. This book made me cry. And there's actually a couple lines in here that deeply, deeply resonated with me and spoke to how I felt for a majority of my life within friendships and not fitting in and wondering why you're always second best. Eve has a moment where she kind of talks about feeling like she is never good enough and that she's always the friend that's chosen last or always the friend that is a second thought. They're never the first thought. They're never at the forefront of a friendship. There's always other shiny and new things within a friendship that overshadow Eve. And so therefore she kind of floats around different friend groups not really fitting. And if I don't relate to that on a fundamental level, like the moment that I read that passage, I cried because I resonated with it so deeply and so immediately like I knew exactly what she was talking about I knew exactly how that felt and it was just very very overwhelming and then there was a line with Jacob and the thing about Jacob is he is autistic and so he's talking about how he feels like he never fits in places and how he doesn't understand why we can't celebrate all types of people and ways of being this book was everything I was already loving this book in general and then the audiobook narration kind of took it to the next level. So if you are reading the Brown Sisters series, I highly recommend listening to them on audiobook, but especially Eve Brown. There's just something about that narrator that made this whole reading experience even more magical. So actor age Eve Brown follows Eve Brown and she is the youngest sister in the Brown Sisters. So if you've read the rest of the series, then you know that Chloe and Danny are Eve's older sisters and Eve has always been a very free spirit. She's kind of fluttered between different jobs she can't really hold down a career per se and she doesn't necessarily want a career and when we meet Eve Brown at the beginning of this book she has just kind of failed at a job venture and her parents are fed up and tell her that she needs to get her life together and that they are no longer going to be the people who save her and she needs to figure things out on her own and so she takes this news very poorly and goes on this very long drive finds this random inn sees that they need a baker decides that that's what she's going to do and applies for the job immediately like they're in the middle of interviews and she kind of just pops in. She ends up nailing the interview and they want to hire her but Jacob who is the inn owner and the male love interest is very hesitant. He's kind of a curmudgeon one would say and he immediately doesn't like Eve's energy because it doesn't align with his energy very well but somehow they make it work she ends up working there and the way that they form their relationship is just really sweet and really organic and I I loved it. It was the fourth question is a book you wish more people would read and hands down it has to be role playing. This is another romance but the reason that this came to mind when I saw this question is because role playing just did so many things right for me as a reader. So first off the two love interests are older. The female love interest is in her mid 40s and the male love interest is in his early 50s that's first. Second, they play video games. They like Dungeons and Dragons. They like things that people say that you're supposed to grow out of as you get older and that's very much not the case for them. So they actually meet online playing a game together and as a matter of fact both of them assume the other is younger because obviously the landscape of those games is usually younger people in their 20s and their teens and so they just kind of assume that both of them are in their 20s. They do strike up a friendship but it's very like at arm's length because they don't know how old each other really is and then when they discover that they are both older like closer in age they start to talk more and have this beautiful friendship that blossoms into really liking each other and having a crush on each other. Third this is queer and also explores coming out when you're older and understanding your sexuality when you were older and it was simply beautiful. I got so emotional when we got to the part of one of our characters exploring their sexuality and for the first time ever understanding themselves and there is a moment in the book when they literally say I thought I was broken and you've literally fixed everything for me. It was just beautiful. Like it's too much to handle. So I really wish that more people would read this book. I've been seeing it kind of floating around but not as much as I wish that it would. I will say it's not spicy. Like it's not a very spicy book. There is maybe a scene or two but I don't even remember if we get like an intimate scene that's in detail. So it's very mild on the sex but like the relationship is so fun and sweet and I just love that they're older. Question number five is a book I love but I can't recommend. It's just for the summer. And listen, listen, listen. I know. I know. I know. This is going to be on a few people's favorites list. I already know that. I've seen a few mid-year tags already where this is their favorite book. Totally get that. I loved it. I gave it like a 4.5 stars. But 
hear me out. I can't in good conscience just tell somebody to read this because there is so much trauma in this book. There is so much trauma in this book. As a matter of fact, some people have said that this almost feels like trauma porn and I can't necessarily disagree. The reason that this resonated so deeply with me is because a lot of the trauma that some of these characters deal with are things that I've been working through my entire life. And so for me as a reader, it's very cathartic to see specific things on page. It's another reason why I don't highly recommend Crying in H Mart, even though I think it's a beautiful and important read. I also know how traumatizing it could be for someone not understanding what that book is. I felt seen on these pages and I really resonated with the characters in here. On the same note, I was also very annoyed and frustrated by things that happened in here because I had lived those things and made those mistakes. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I can't just on a whim recommend this book and I feel like it's not going to work for a lot of people because of how much trauma is in here. I feel like the other two Abby Humanist books had a really good balance of being funny and lighthearted but also having hard moments. This is kind of the opposite of that. I feel like this is the majority of having hard moments and there's just a sprinkling of lighthearted and funny. So I think that if you have read Abby Humanist before and you were highly anticipating this, hoping that it would be like the other two books that have just recently come out by her, it's not. It's so much trauma. It's so sad. There are so many moments in here that will make you angry and make you frustrated. I think that a lot of people will not like the couple in here and I also think that a lot of people will assume this couple is enabling one another. And the thing is it's like you're not wrong but I still absolutely loved this. I, I have my tear is on it. My tear right there on it, loved it, cried, got through this book so quickly. But I just personally would not feel right recommending this to a wide audience. So that being said, if you are interested in this, please go in with caution because we are following two main characters that are going through it. So we have our female main character named Emma and she has a very hard relationship with her mother. Her mother has been in and out of her life her entire life and she has a lot of abandonment issues. Her mother gaslights her a lot about the past and her mother will leave on a whim for any old man. But Emma, just desperately wanting her mother in her life, makes excuse after excuse for her mother and always lets her back into her life no matter the pain that she has caused. And then we have Justin and Justin's mother was recently convicted of a crime and she is going to have to go to prison for I believe it was six years and he will now be responsible to take full custody of all of his younger siblings. So Emma and Justin end up meeting in the midst of this happening to him because of this Reddit thread that Justin posted talking about how he has a curse that every person he dates after they break up, they find the love of their life. And Emma responds to it and says, oh, the same thing happens to me. Maybe we should date to break the curse. They start fake dating, but but obviously they're falling for each other. In the midst of them fake dating and kind of falling for each other, Emma makes this big decision that she's gonna move near Justin. Well, when she does this, she ends up living near this guy that her mom decides to start dating and her mom comes into her life like a whirlwind and upends things. And so between the two of them, there's a lot of trauma and drama and tears and heartache. And this romance went in very unexpected ways for me, but I think the fact that I resonate so much with a lot of the trauma that these characters are trying to work through it hit me differently than it probably will if you just go into this looking for a regular regular Abby Humanist time because it wasn't that. Question number six is the book that was the biggest surprise this year. Honestly bloom. I honestly didn't know if I would like this book Basically, it's about two women named Ash and Ro, and they develop this obsession with each other after meeting at a farmer's market, but Ro is falling in love with a woman for the first time ever. So Ro is very easily letting go of red flags, and this devolves into the most unhinged story maybe I've ever read. I don't think it's the weirdest thing I've ever read, but it's definitely the most unhinged story that I've ever read. And I will tell you that the last chapter took me out. I think this was most surprising for me because I was told that this would be very predictable and that I would probably be able to predict everything that was happening. So I wasn't really sure if I would enjoy it because of the predictability. While people aren't wrong that you could predict a lot that's gonna happen in this book, it still didn't negate from the fact that this fucking blew my brain up. <laughs> Like, what did I read? And like, at times, because of the tone of this book, it felt so unserious. But then the last couple of chapters, I was like, what? I 
excuse me? When I finished the book, I had a very, very similar reaction to when I read Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, which I feel like if I had to give comp titles for this book, it's a combination of Comfort Me With Apples and Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke. But when I finished Things Have Gotten Worse, I genuinely was like, I think I hated that. But with this one, I finished it and I was like, I think I hated this, but also I think this is my new favorite book. I think I loved it. And I can confidently say that much like Natural Beauty, I have thought about this at least once a week since finishing it back in April. I don't know, this was a very big surprise and um, it blew my brain up. Question number seven is the weirdest book that I've read this year. And honestly, I love this question because I really do like weird girl horror and weird girl fiction. So I would have to say of what I've read so far, Chlorine probably has to be the weirdest book that I've read this year. It's also the book that made me the most uncomfortable, I feel. <laughs> but it was such an interesting exploration of girlhood. So our main character, Ren, we meet her about 13 or 14 when she joins the swim team. And she quickly becomes obsessed with swimming. And her swim coach also becomes obsessed with her. He sees her as like a prodigy, as a star athlete, and it starts to lean in the realm of grooming. And so Ren becomes obsessed with swimming, about her body, what her body looks like, what she's consuming, how often is she swimming, how frequently can she get into the water. And this devolves into Ren wanting to be a mermaid and kind of thinking that she's meant to be a mermaid, she's meant to be in the sea. Between all of this, we are seeing aspects of coming of age, of girlhood, of like starting your period for the first time, of female friendships and female longing. She has a best friend named Kathy and it's always this blurred line between friendship and kind of being in love with each other. And interspersed between chapters are letters from Kathy to Ren. So we know that somewhere down the line, Kathy and Ren stop talking to each other to the point that Kathy is writing her letters to get her attention again. And so the whole book is leading up to this moment where we figure out what happened between Kathy and Ren. And there is so many weird and uncomfortable moments in here, especially towards the end. This isn't the type of horror where everything is horrific all the time. There's just a lot of uncomfortable moments, especially like real life moments that are written in such a way that make you feel viscerally uncomfortable. But there's also a deep exploration of racism and being Chinese in a dominantly white space, a white rich space at that, as well as an exploration of being queer and not really understanding what that means for you, especially in a dominantly straight place. There's a deep exploration of grooming and what sports can can do to children. It has a lot of commentary in such a short page length and I definitely would love to read this again because I was so focused on other aspects that like I definitely got the central themes of it but I would love to reread this to get more nuance from it. I don't know if I would read it anytime soon because of how uncomfortable it made me feel but this hands down has to be one of the weirdest books in terms of how uncomfortable it made me feel. I can't lie to you I keep taking breaks because I'm so sick of hearing myself talk. <laughs> but question number eight is big disappointment, The Well of Ascension by Brandon Sanderson. As a matter of fact, it was kind of the final empire as a whole. I didn't end up loving this trilogy as much as I thought that I would, especially because I did really enjoy Mistborn and I gave it four stars both times reading it, but progressively as I got through the series, I just enjoyed it less and less. To be completely honest, the only thing by Brandon Sanderson that I can say I've highly, highly enjoyed is The Way of Kings. I ended up reading that for my first ever read it down when Yasmin chose it for me and I really, really liked it. It gave me a lot of hope because previous to that, I did read Mistborn, I liked it, gave it four stars, and then had no desire to ever move on with the series. And so I was like, hmm, is that a sign that maybe Brandon Sanderson just doesn't stick with me the way that other authors do? But when Yasmin chose The Way of Kings for Read It Down, I was like, okay, this is the second chance. I gave him a second chance. I really enjoyed it. I was actually excited to move on with the series. I still am excited to move on with the series. I am going to be rereading The Way of Kings in July. But I guess for me, I just don't really care about anything else in this world, which is difficult because much like Robin Hobb, everything is connected. It's not as connected as Robin Hobb is, like that you need to read specific things to understand everything else. But from what I know, it's actually turning into that. So I'm a little bit nervous about only wanting to read the Stormlight archives because am I going to have to read other things to fully understand and grasp the rest of Way of Kings? So yeah, it's just been really disappointing to me because of the way that he has talked about on this platform. I really think thought as a fantasy reader like yes Brandon Sanderson is the guy that I need to read but mm, 
Mm. Question number nine is my new favorite author and I feel like a new author to me is both Jen Lyons and Ling Ling Wong and it's exciting because Jen Lyons is actually publishing a standalone novel with dragons called The Sky on Fire I believe is the full title in July. So I do have an arc of it. I need to start reading it like immediately, but I'm very excited to pick that up and this will kind of solidify if she does become a new author for me. Ling Ling Wong, I don't know if she's coming out with a new book anytime soon, but once she does, I will automatically pick it up. Question number 10 is authors I have given up on. While I haven't given up on Brandon Sanderson, he is that close. He's that close to me giving up on him. But the person that I've definitely given up on is Jay Bree. So Jay Bree is best known for the Broken Bond series, but she has more recently been publishing an enemies to lovers fantasy romance. The first one being A Crown of Oaths and Curses. And so there was a lot of drama with Jay Bree, which I'm not gonna get into. We've all talked about it. All I can say is that she had a pushback with her second book and instead of being professional about it, it got really messy and unprofessional and there were some things that were said and done that felt very unnecessary which is a big reason that I'm kind of giving up on her because I really don't know when the next books will come out in this series. I'm not sure how long it's supposed to be and just the unknown of it not knowing what this author is going to do next not really knowing if things are going to be edited or if they're going to come out on time or if things are constantly going to get pushed back etc etc. I just feel like it's better now to cut my losses because I've only read the novellas in this one book. And while I did love this book, and I love Rook, one of the main characters, to death, probably one of my favorite heroines, I can safely say I would rather not invest even more time and energy into this when I don't really know when I'm gonna get something next. And now the last five questions in this tag are kind of around my goals and some videos that I really enjoyed filming. So question number 11 is what was my StoryGraph goal and how is that going? If you don't know what StoryGraph is, it's basically an alternative to Goodreads. And one of my goals this year was to use StoryGraph regularly. So I use both Goodreads and StoryGraph, but I've been trying to focus majority on StoryGraph. I just like to continue updating Goodreads as well because I can't lie to you, the social aspect of Goodreads has made a choke Cold. But anyway, my story graph slash Goodreads goal was 100 books and I am currently at 61 books read. That's including DNFs. I think I have four or five DNFs. I include DNFs because I usually read to 50 to 60% of a book before I decide to DNF it, which is probably too long, but you know, I read pretty big books, so I think it's it's reasonable enough. But yeah, I count them because I read a good chunk of them and I would rather just count them. But if you don't, that's cool. Question number 12 asks, how many of my 24 and 24 books have I read? And the 24 and 24 is basically 24 books that I wanted to read in the year of 2024. Some of these are friends recommendations and some of these are my own recommendations to myself. And I have read a whopping six of the 24. I'm not doing great. Like I've technically read one a month if you do the math on that, but there's 24, not 12. So like I'm not on track. I'm gonna guess that I probably won't be able to fulfill this, but I was thinking that maybe next year if I wanna do something similar, I will do a 12 Rex from 12 Friends because at least I could do one of those a month and I think that would be a lot more fun. So yeah, I don't think my 24 and 24 is going to get read, but it might because let's move into question number 13, which is how are my goals going this year and do I have any new goals for the rest of the year? So my goals for this year are going fine. I didn't really have that many goals this year. I feel like for the most part, I have been reaching my goals. I think the only thing I've kind of been struggling with this year is book buying and I mentioned that I wanted to read more backlist books. I haven't been paying too much attention to what is backlist and what's not when I'm reading things. I feel like I'm actually not paying attention as much to reading backlist as I thought that I would which is perfectly fine. Like it was kind of an arbitrary goal that I could give or take. I think one of the goals I'm doing pretty decently at is making content that I'm excited about. Basically every video that I have put out at this point is something I'm excited to put out. So I feel like with the majority of my goals, like I'm doing fine. I'm not fully paying attention to them as heavily as I have in past years. So I think that's a part of it too, where I feel like I'm probably doing fine at my goals, but I just am trying not to get too caught up in it. I'm just trying to have fun with the content that I'm making, which was my number one goal. Oh, and also using StoryGraph was one of my goals, which I have been doing. I actually have been keeping up with both StoryGraph and Goodreads. But in terms of goals, for the coming year. I'm actually starting 
not a video series. I don't want to call it a video series because I'm just going to be doing weekly vlogs. But this is because I have decided to put myself on a book buying ban. And I will go into more detail in a video that will be coming out soon talking about this. But this is a new goal that I'm adding into my life for the next five months. And it's not complicated. It's just a, I had an intrusive thought one day and I decided to act upon that intrusive thought. And will I regret it? And will I actually stick with it? Time will tell. I know in my quarterly update, I did mention something about some new goals. Don't remember them. So they're probably not happening. I didn't write them down anywhere. Yes, they're on video, but if I didn't write them down, was I that serious about them? I don't really know. I can't lie to you. I've been really bad about goals in the last couple of years. I think the last two years, especially like every time I'm excited about making goals and like reaching those goals, I lose steam very quickly. I used to be really good about being goal oriented, but now I'm just trying to vibe and have fun. And yeah, if I don't remember the goal, then it's not happening and that's okay. Question number 14 is what books do you need to read by the end of the year? All of them. I need to read all of them. I need to read all the books, every book. All of the books that exist on my shelves, I need to read them. And question 15, also the final question is, what were some of your favorite videos to make? And because I did talk about my favorite video that I made in my quarterly check-in, I'm going to be talking about the favorite video that I made in the last quarter. The two videos that stick out to me are the Ultimate Book Challenge. I love watching the Ultimate Book Challenge. Basically, you go book shopping and you buy a book or however many books that you wanna buy and you're in theory supposed to read one of the books that you bought in that same book shopping vlog. I absolutely love watching these types of vlogs so I finally got to do one and I really had a lot of fun. I actually read Bloom in it. I read Bloom and You Exist Too Much and I had such a fun time so I think I would probably do that again next year because I'm on a book buying man. And then I also had a lot of fun doing my weird girl vlog. This was very much inspired by one of my patrons named Sarah, who's been in her weird girl era. And I was like, listen, let me get back to my weird girl roots. And I read three weird girl books or sad girl books, if you will. And I had a lot of fun and it was just fun being inspired by one of my patrons. So I don't know, I just had a lot of fun doing it. Amazing, that is the end of the tag. Thanks for hanging out with me. I talked way too much. So if you've made it this far and you have nothing else to say, feel free to leave a flower bouquet emoji down below and I will talk to y'all next time. Bye friends.